First, we are broadening the scope of Canada's anti-money laundering and terrorist financing rules so that they cover crowdfunding platforms and the payment service providers they use. These changes cover all forms of transactions, including digital assets, such as cryptocurrencies. The illegal blockades have highlighted the fact that crowdfunding platforms and some of the payment service providers they use are not fully captured under the Proceeds of Crime and Terrorist Financing Act. Conservative Party members can stand with people who wave swastikas. They can stand with people who wave uh, the Confederate flag. We will choose to stand with Canadians who deserve to be able to get to their jobs, who will be able to get their lives back. These illegal protests need to stop, and they will, Mr. Speaker. This is Policy Matters, and I am your host, Mongo Slade. Today, we're going to be talking about Canada. Justin Trudeau, the Emergencies Act, and why it is a pretty bad idea to live in a country like Canada. Now, I know that Canada is a country that most people tend to like. It is a relatively free society. You know, there is not a lot of oppression. It is not a violent third world country. But that's actually what makes places like Australia and Canada so bad is because People tend to think, well, this isn't so bad when they consider how bad things could really be in certain places like in South America or certain African countries or in some of the Arab countries where people are saying, oh, women can't drive. They kill gays, all this sort of stuff. Hey, my bank account being frozen or me being airlifted to a to a concentration camp. I'm sorry, an anti-vax camp. Well, that's not so bad. In comparison, all you have to do is comply. If you comply, then bad things don't happen. And that's actually a big, big problem when you live in a society like the United States, Canada, or Australia, or even England. So today we're going to talk about the Emergencies Act in Canada, as far as what I know about it. And we're going to talk about the Freedom Convoy and all of the different things that has been occurring in Canada for the last, and to be quite honest, it's been going on for over 30 years, if we want to be serious. What's been going on in Canada has been going on for a long, long time. And in discussing this, I'm going to introduce a concept that many of you have never actually heard of. It is called velvet totalitarianism. So in having this discussion, which I don't know how long it'll be, but we're going to have this discussion and it ought to be pretty fun. So first, I'm going to introduce the concept of velvet totalitarianism. Now, I'm pretty sure everybody listening to this video has heard of Dr. Jordan Peterson. Well, before Jordan Peterson, way back in the aughts of 1997, there was a Dr. John Frarity who wrote a paper in, uh, about the University of Toronto. And he says, quote, the current contrasting culture of comfort on Canadian campuses is a velvet totalitarian one where, except for the severity of punishments, all other salient features of a totalitarian regime are present. Distinctions that are clear in principle, though difficult to make in practice under certain circumstances, are asserted to hold between acts and opinions, opinions and performance, academic freedom and power, symmetrical and asymmetrical power, issue and person directed opinions. This is in the abstract of his paper, Academic Freedom versus Velvet Totalitarianism, Culture of Comfort on Can Current Canadian Campuses, Some Fundamental Terms and Distinctions. So what he is saying and what he lays out in this paper, how the totalitarian regimes, how their thinking and their culture has seeped into a democratic country like Canada, specifically within the universities. So here's another piece of the paper. He says, I am aware that my use of the term totalitarianism in the Canadian campus context is offensive to some. It may seem to others to be inappropriate without the qualifier velvet. The term totalitarianism is obviously not applicable to democratic societies like that in Canada. Nevertheless, I suggest aside from the severity of punishment, which is, of course, an absolutely crucial difference, hence my reference to, to velvet totalitarianism. 
Other features of totalitarianism do apply to the current Canadian campus scene. Most striking, perhaps, is that in totalitarian societies, the comfort criterion takes precedence over considerations of truth in general and fairness to individuals in particular. Comfort is essentially conformity to institutional ideology. It is, in fact, the comfort of a particular ideology that is protected rather than that of all individuals. So that gives you an idea of what has been going on in Canada since at least the 80s. So long before Jordan Peterson came out and started talking about, you know, Bill C-16 and uh, all of the forced diversity stuff that he talked about and, be and became very famous for, rightfully so, for being the one man in Canada with a spine. This sort of stuff has been talked about. And this guy worked at the same university as Jordan Peterson, which is the University of Toronto. So there are several different things that we want to look at when we're talking about velvet totalitarianism. And he gives us three pretty good, uh, three things that we can look at when discussing whether we live in a sort of totalitarian system. He says, quote, the first is the presence of uninterpretable laws. A totalitarian example of this is that in countries behind the former Iron Curtain, there was no specification of what it meant to, for instance, be a crypto capitalist and therefore punishable as an enemy of the people. A Canadian campus velvet totalitarian parallel is the presence of speech codes that are interpretable only by equity officers whose judgments are made in terms of subjective comfort rather than objective specification of what is contrary to the code. These speech codes vary in severity and also in terms of whether they pay no attention to academic freedom or pay it token attention. Uh, and he says what they have in common is that the offense or harassment is defined not in terms of what the forbidden expressions are, but in terms of what the, of whether usually designated group individuals are likely to be offended. So let us discuss the second feature that he says the second feature is the presence and power of unqualified pseudo experts. The clearest totalitarian instance of this sort of figure is the Soviet commissar. In an organization like the military, commissars formed a parallel structure to the officer corps and had veto power over that corps, even though the commissars themselves were totally uneducated in and hence ignorant of military matters. Canadian campus equity officers who give advice on academic disciplinary issues like the nature of the curriculum or what faculty should be hired are commissar like figures on North American campuses. Even colleagues in the same department in the same area with a discipline were considered to be out of line if they gave advice to faculty members concerning how and what to teach in their classes. Now faculty are expected to accept advice from these quote equity commissars who are not only unqualified in the particular discipline, but often do not have even have the requisite general academic background. Now we know that these people exist. They exist in the United States a lot more now than they used to. They are called diversity and equity officers. They exist in almost every college campus today and they exist. They have existed for a while now. Okay. So the third feature, he says, a third feature is the freezing fear of engaging in public discussion of controversial but fundamental issues. In totalitarian societies, the taboo is against the discussion of any real political issues. In Canadian academia, these seems of late to be parallel situation. For example, in 1993, a professor of sociology at Carleton University in Ottawa asserted in class that in his view, bisexuals who knew they had AIDS and yet continued their sexual activities without telling their partners were psychopaths. This assertion was deemed to be offensive by some students. And by that afternoon, an administrative letter of reprimand had reached the professor. About a week later, I was contacted in Toronto for a radio interview of the case. At the beginning of our conversation, I asked an interviewer what the opinion of the local academics was. The interviewer replied that he had contacted about a dozen Ottawa academics and to a woman, man, they all declined to publicly discuss, let alone defend academic freedom. 
although they were happy to discuss any other topic like global warming, privatization, and so on. This is just one small indication of more general reluctance to discuss such issues in any public way. In other words, and this is a big deal when you have pri publicly funded universities. In publicly funded universities, you will end up with these people who are scared of losing their, I mean, you're going to be scared of losing your job anyway. But when you're publicly funded, you're going to pick your spots, right? You're not going to run a counter to the people who run the purse strings. In other words, why would you question the government if that's where you get your money from? This is, tends to be why one of so many college campuses are so left leaning and having left leaning com uh, college campuses leads to the uh, indoctrination of students into left wing propaganda, which creates the culture that you go, we're going to be talking about in Canada currently. Now, he says the fourth feature is status defined ethics. He says in a totalitarian society, acts of torture and murder are permissible, provided the agent is a member of the secret police and the victim is a quote crypto capitalist. The current velvet totalitarian parallel is the apparent belief that it is all right to stereotype, say, Anglo-Saxon white males, but not non-Anglo-Saxon, non-white, non-males. Of course, there is a huge difference between being killed and being stereotyped, which is why I use the qualifier velvet in describing the current Canadian campus scene. Again, you think that this guy was living today. This was 1997. Right. So basically, if you are a white male, you're the enemy and it's OK for you to be stereotyped, mistreated, abused, etc. And he says the fifth uh, feature is this is the most important one to the discussion we're going to be having today. It says the fifth feature is the demonization of dissidents. Dissidents to the Nazi ideology were subjected to anti-Semitic smears, which were modified in terms of whether the dissidents were themselves Jewish or not. Dissidents against communist totalitarian regimes are demonized as greedy capitalist pigs. In all such instances of demonization, the powers of the dissident are exaggerated. Nazi propaganda asserted that Jews had almost total control over the world's financial resources, while communist propaganda ascribed a similar level of financial control to capitalists. The current velvet totalitarian parallel is to ascribe racist motives to organizations which oppose so-called equity policies and also characterizes a bunch of white male professors concerned only to maintain their almost complete powers and privileges. In all of these instances, of course, demonization is a much more convenient way of dealing with a dissident voice than the alternative of dealing with the arguments that the dissidents raise. And the demonization works too. Few are those who were ner not nervous about being characterized as Jew lovers under the Nazis, capitalist swine under the communists or racists on Canadian campuses. Now that brings us directly into what we're going to be talking about here with the Freedom Convoy. So the Cre Freedom Convoy, uh, which was, I heard it was started by a lady named Tamara Litch. And what, they, what took place was Canada had very extreme lockdown measures, including mask mandates for truckers who were in their trucks alone were required to be wearing masks. In response to this, the Freedom Convoy, all of these uh, anti-vax, anti-mask truckers decided they were going to block some major roadways and block some major areas in order to force the Canadian government to drop their vaccine mandates. They were then labeled terrorists by the Canadian government. Think about that. They blocked some roadways with their trucks and then were called terrorists by the Canadian government. Justin Trudeau, in response to the Freedom Convoy, invoked what is called the Emergencies Act. So I did some research on what the Emergencies Act is. And what, we, what I found was very, very interesting. See, in October of 1970, there was a Canadian issue that was called the October Crisis. A uh, Quebecois labor minister and a British trade commissioner were both kidnapped by a Quebecois group that uh, was searching for 
of Quebec liberation from the rest of Canada. There's always a bunch of Quebecois who want to create their own country. And Pierre Trudeau, the father, quote unquote, of Justin Trudeau, invoked what is called the War Measures Act. The War Measures Act uh, allowed them to arrest uh, a bunch of these people really, really were terrorists. Of course, they had kidnapped people. So they actually had victims. Uh, the War Measures Act was replaced by the Emergencies Act in 1988. So the Emergencies Act uh, had never actually been used. The Emergency Act is def the word emergency in the law is is um, defined as a national emergency. A national emergency is, quote, an urgent and critical situation of a temporary nature. It is it requires that a seriously endangers the life or safety of Canadians and is of a nature that exceeds the capacity or authority of a province to deal with it, or B, seriously threatens the ability of the Canadian government to preserve the sovereignty, security, and integrity of Canada, which cannot be dealt with by using any other laws. And the Emergencies Act can only really been used, can only really be used, rather, in four types of situations. One, public welfare emergencies, such as natural disasters. Two, the public order uh, emergencies, which are threats to national security, three international emergencies or four war emergencies. All of this information comes from the Montreal Gazette. So if it's wrong, blame them. So in order for Justin Trudeau to actually be able to use the war it, well, the Emergencies Act, he had to alert the people to an emergency. What was the emergency that he used? Threats to national security. So according to the BBC, this was February the 15th, uh, there was a week-long blockade against the COVID-19 restrictions. In Ottawa, they referred to it as an occupation, which lasted three weeks. The Emergencies Act gave Justin Trudeau the power to order evacuations, to order essential services to be rendered, such as uh, tow trucks to come in and actually pull the truckers off the line, and it actually banned traveling. On February the 19th, the Foundation for Economic Education posted an article about the Canada and the banks. So during this time, we started hearing a lot about Canada using the Emergencies Act to freeze the bank accounts of individuals not only involved in the Freedom Convoy, but also of people who had been donating money to them. So the article lays out the case that the government announced that the banks could not no longer do business with the Freedom Convoy, led by truckers against the vaccine mandates. Of course, Finance Minister Christia Freeland and Prime Minister Justin Trudeau evoked the Emergencies Act to remove resources from the Freedom Convoy, calling it terrorist financing. Those who donated to the convoy were also targeted. Canada's banks then suspiciously went offline for several hours after Freeland's announcement. About five major Canadian banks went offline for a specific amount of time. Uh, then it, the major primary functions of these banks ceased for a little while. There was fear of a bank run. Now, for those of you who don't know, a bank run is when everybody runs to the bank and pulls their money out. Now, there was no evidence of an actual bank run, but there was actually fear that it would may lead to a bank run later. And there's some economic uh, theories that say that fear of bank runs actually lead to bank runs. So apparently all of that stuff uh, cleared out and a bunch of people was posting um, charts showing the effects that the Emergencies Act was having on the banking system in Canada. On February the 21st, the National Post of Canada uh, put out an article which they talked about the various police that came from Vancouver, Toronto, Quebec, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police and the Ontario Provincial Police, among others, were called into Ottawa to break up the Ottawa Freedom Convoy. During this time, the RCPM in Ottawa was busted by Rebel, by, by, uh, Rebel News, uh, talking about extra pay for people who worked on the convoy, and a horse trampled a woman during this time too, as uh, Justin Trudeau's uh, Jack Boots ran the streets of Ottawa. Around this time, these... I will try to put some of these pictures of what the Royal Canadian Mounted Police were saying on the screen. Um, it, it was very hard for me to read because the print was very small. But uh, the woman who was trampled by horses in Ottawa, she had uh, injured her collarbone. 
Uh, the Ottawa RCMPs claimed that the horses were used to disperse crowds. Around this same time, Canadian newspapers start began to publish the names of people who donated to the Freedom Convoy. This is doxing. And the Canadian newspapers were 100% with it. The organizer of the Freedom Convoy was later arrested. Uh, this was uh, uh, discussed in the Kitchener uh, City News, Kitchener's Kitchener, Ontario. Tamara Litch had been arrested um, and was denied bail. She was not charged with any major violent crime, but was still denied bail. This was on February the 22nd. The judge claimed that she had a substantial likelihood of reoffending. The judge who ran as a liberal, Julie Bourgeau, claimed that Litch was, quote, obstinate and not and the judge herself was not reassured that she would not reoffend and that her. Her detention was, quote, necessary for protection and safety of the public. A person who blocked the roads with her truck was a danger to the public. <laughs> 206 accounts involving uh, $7.8 million was affected by bank freezing and 115 vehicles were to towed. Ultimately, the Freedom Convoy, of course, was crushed by under the boot of Justin Trudeau and the Canadian government. But that was not all. Now, Canadian psychologists are claiming, uh, this is an article from the CBC, the Canadian Broadcasting Company. The trucks have left Ottawa, but phantom honking lingers for many downtown. Post-traumatic stress from weeks of honking is a temporary mild trauma, psychologists says. The CBC is now telling you that there are people who are traumatized from all of the honking horns in Ottawa. Not all of the police stomping on people and not all of the many, not the two years of vaccine lockdowns and mass mandates. No, nah, we're not, we're not going to talk about all of that trauma or how that may have affected children. We're going to talk about people who are upset about horns honking downtown in Ottawa. So what did we learn here? And we learned the absurdity of, of Canada, right? We learned that in Canada, if you are a, what they call first nations, or if you are black, you can do whatever you want in terms of protesting. If you're considered white, then whatever you do is terrorism and if you cause PTSD to some people, you no longer have rights. You don't know. You no longer have any individual liberties. I mean, they already proved that in Canada that you don't have any, for starters, Canada doesn't have freedom of speech. They never did. I don't think they have freedom of speech since the sixties or something like that. So Canada doesn't have freedom of speech like they do in the United States. So that was already out the window. Now you have no privacy rights. The newspapers in Canada can publish your name if you give money to people they don't like. Now, the American newspapers have been doing that for a while, too. I think it's rather scumbag behavior for the newspapers to do that. But, I mean, what can you do? You can't really even sue newspapers. It's very difficult for you to do so. We learned that you don't have any property rights. If you have a website like a Give, Send, Go or a GoFundMe, the Canadian government will just snatch up your, 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 your company. If you give money, the, co the, the Canadian government will just go into your bank account and freeze it through your bank. They control the banks. So they control your physical body by forcing you to take drugs that you do not want to take. They can force you to say things they want you to say just by passing laws, like pronoun laws, forcing you to say things that you don't want to say. They can force you to wear masks that you don't want to wear. They can go into your bank account and freeze it. They can deny you access to your own money. They can take your job away. They can do whatever they want. And people just say, you know what? Maybe you should have complied. It's just a mask. It's just a little shot. It's okay. Okay. It's not that big of a deal. Sure, they're going to go in there and maybe, maybe they can do whatever they want. And guess what? Freeland, Christia Freeland, the woman whose idea it was to use the emergency uh, act. Some of these things are going to be permanent. 
like the ability to freeze people's bank accounts. The government, once given an inch, will take a mile. Everybody who's clapping and agreeing with Justin Trudeau today will eventually find their lives in the hands of a government they don't like who is going to have the ability to freeze their bank accounts. Who is going to have the ability to force them to say things they don't want to say. That is going to force them to do things they don't want to do. A government that has the authority to do all of that has almost complete and total control over your life. And Canada and Australia has been in a very bad place. I mean, they had concentration camps in Australia and you had very smart people. You know, um, what was the lady's name from Quillette? She was making excuses for it. Oh, it's just temporary. Oh, it, it, they're, they're sunbathing. It's like they were moved from their homes to a camp for the unvaccinated. They were literally putting people in camps. Now, now Canada is shutting bank accounts. You would really see the velvet totalitarianism of the West. It is very bad these days. It's moving at a snail's pace here in the United States. We don't have things that are this bad yet, but we have laws like the Emergency Act. We had the Patriot Act. And if that's what's the, the big thing here is that once you get called a terrorist and you probably saw this quite often when Donald Trump was in office and you had people saying Black Lives Matter are terrorists. You can use the Patriot Act against them. It was it was smart for Trump not to do it. But it was bad for him not to do it because it's not its not like the, the Patriot Act doesn't exist anymore. It still exists. And they've been using it to investigate pretty much everyone they wanted. The January 6th uh, ordeal here in the United States, a lot of that stuff is Patriot Act stuff. You know, denying bail to people who are not in any way violent. Um, rounding up people, chasing people down, doxing. A lot of all of this stuff, all of these powers that the government gave themselves and screwing over you, the individual. And could people continue to vote for this stuff? But it's called velvet totalitarianism because it's not complete totalitarianism. It's all temporary. We can just punish the hell of our out of our enemies swiftly in a way that won't bother other people. As long as we don't start gunning people down in the street then it's cool, right? You know, just comply. Just do what you're told. Take your vaccine, wear your mask, and don't you dare support anybody who is peacefully protesting. I mean real peaceful protests, not uh, 95% peaceful protests. Look, I understand for anybody who got this far and you are a supporter of what Justin Trudeau did, I understand that the Canadian truckers were definitely damaging the Canadian economy. They were losing a lot of money. They really were. I, I'm not, not going to say that they did everything perfectly. This is not a video, quote unquote, supporting the Freedom Convoy. This is a video talking about the government invoking a national security threat towards truckers who all they wanted was some bodily integrity. All they were saying is drop the vaccine and the mask mandates. I don't want to have to wear this thing on my face while I'm driving in my car or driving on my truck on the road by myself. I don't want to have to do that. And the government, we will not discuss this. What do you mean you won't discuss this? I'm in the truck by myself. It doesn't matter how much economic damage the Freedom Convoy did. When you look at what they were asking for, they weren't looking to to completely overthrow the government. Some of these people did want Justin Trudeau to step down because they do believe that he had been abusing his authority, which of course, if you look at people who are freedom loving people, Justin Trudeau or Joe Biden, hell Trump, all of them exceeded their authority two years ago when they just started mandating vaccines and mandating masks and mandating all of this different stuff. Government should not have the authority to mandate that you put anything into your body, wear anything or say anything that you don't want to do. That is a simple, very simple request. It is the simplest of requests. It is an individual liberty request. All of the people who wanted Justin Trudeau to step down and all that kind of stuff, those people can be ignored. 
All Justin Trudeau had to do is say, look, we'll drop the, the trucking mandates, which is usually what uh, politicians do when uh, a specific sector of society is pissed. Like you often see uh, Republicans, they'll argue against something like uh, public sector unions. And they'll say public sector unions, they're awful. Thumbs down to public sector unions. And then the police will be like, what about us? And then firefighters will be like, what about us? And then prison guards will be like, what about us? And then the Republicans will be like, except prison guards, firefighters, and police officers. Everybody else doesn't need a union, right? All Justin Trudeau had to do was say, oh, the vaccine mandates and the, and the vaccine and the mass mandates, they don't apply to truckers. And the truckers would have been like, honk, honk, and went on about their way. Guaranteed. All you had to do was exempt truckers. You know, and most people would have been like, okay, well, there's no reason for me to block the roads. I'm out of here. That's usually how people, politicians handle this kind of stuff. You know, when you get into a situation that's a very specific sect of society that is upset, usually you just appease that specific sect, especially if it doesn't bother it. If, if other people have gotten upset because truckers were exempt, nobody would have cared. It wouldn't have been enough people to care. But what they did, Justin Trudeau, Christia Freeland, what they did is they saw an opportunity to extend the powers of the Canadian federal government and they did it and they got away with it. And then as you were complaining about that, Putin decided to go out and blow up U Ukraine. So guess what? There's people dying in the Ukraine. Nobody's talking about Canada anymore. Nobody cares about Trudeau anymore. He froze some bank accounts. There's a, there's the freedom convoy lady. She's sitting in prison for a nonviolent offense. Eh, who cares? Putin is bad. There are still people sitting in prison for January the 6th in the United States. They're not being given fair trials. We could talk about that all day. They're just using one totalitarian government, one aggressive government to cover the other. When some horrible government in the West does something, Australia is doing some horrible stuff. Oh, we, hey, look at what's going on over here. It's terrible over here. So now everybody's talking about that. And they've just been doing that for the last two damn years. It is what it is, man. But the question is, what can you do? Like, share, and subscribe. I'll talk to you guys later.